This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Okay, good morning. Welcome back to, um, third, to the third lecture of this class. So <clears throat> here's what I want to do today. Um, and some of the topics I'll do today may seem a little bit like I'm jumping so, from topic to topic, but here's sort of the outline for today and the uh, logical flow of ideas. Um, in the last lecture, we talked about linear regression, and today I want to talk about sort of an adaptation of that called locally weighted regression. Um, it's actually a very powerful algorithm that's actually one of my uh, former mentors, probably favorite machine learning algorithm. Um, we'll then talk about the probabilistic interpretation of linear regression and use that to um, move on to our first classification algorithm, which is logistic regression. Um, take a brief digression to tell you about something called the perceptron algorithm, which is something we'll come back to again later this quarter. And um, time allowing, I hope to get to Newton's method, which is, which is an algorithm for fitting logistic regression models. Um, so let's just recap what we're talking about in the previous lecture. Um, Remember the notation I defined was that I used this x superscript i, y superscript i to denote the i training example. And um, when we're talking about linear regression or ordinary least squares, we use this to denote the predicted value output by my hypothesis h um, on the input xi. And my hypothesis was parameterized by um, the vector parameters theta. And so we said that this was equal to sum from right, theta j sij, written more simply as theta transpose x. And um, we had the convention that x subscript 0 is equal to 1. So this accounts for the intercept term in our linear regression model. Um, and lowercase n here was the notation I was using for the, uh, for the number of features in my training set. Okay? So in the example, we're trying to predict housing prices. If we had two features, the size of the house and the number of bedrooms, um, we had two features, and, and was little n was equal to 2. Um, so to finish recapping the previous lecture, we defined this quadratic cost function, j of theta equals 1 half sum from i equals 1 to m of theta of xi minus yi squared, um, where this is a sum over our m training examples in my training set. So lowercase m was the notation I've been using to denote the number of training examples I have for the size of my training set. And um, at the end of the last lecture, we derive the value of theta that minimizes this in closed form, um, which was you know, x transpose x inverse x transpose y. Okay. So um, as I move forward in today's lecture, I'll continue to use this notation. And again, I realize this is a fair amount of notation to all remember. Um, so if partway through this lecture you forgot, you know, if, if you're having trouble remembering what lowercase m is or what lowercase n is or something, please raise your hand and ask. Um, when we talked about linear regression last time, um, we used two features. One of the features was the size of the house in square feet, so the living area of the house. And the other feature was the number of bedrooms in the house. Um, in general, when you're out there applying machine learning algorithms to some problem that you care about, the choice of the features will very much be up to you, right? And um, the way you choose your features to give the learning algorithm will often have a large impact on how well it actually does. Um, so just for example, the choice we made last time was x1 equals to the size. And, and let's, let's, let's leave aside the other feature of the number of bedrooms for now. Let's say we don't have data that tells us how many bedrooms are in these houses. Um, one thing you could do is actually define, oh, let's draw this out. And so 
So let's say that was the size of the hulls, and that's the price of a hull. So if you use this as a feature, maybe you get you know, theta 0 plus theta 1 x1. This is the linear model. Um, if you choose, and we'll just copy the same data set over. Right? You can define a set of features where x1 is equal to the size of the hulls, and x2 is the square of the size of the hulls. Okay, so x1 is the size of the hulls in, say, square footage, and x2 is just take whatever the square footage of the hulls is and just square that number, and this would be another way to come up with a feature. And if you do that, then the same algorithm will end up fitting a quadratic function for you. Um, theta 2, x1 squared. Okay, because uh, this is actually x2. And, you know, depending on what the data looks like, maybe this is a slightly better fit to the data. Um, you can actually take this even further. Oops. Right? Which is, let's see, I have seven training examples here. So you can actually maybe fit up to a sixth order polynomial. You can actually fit a model theta 0 plus theta 1 x1 plus theta 2 x squared plus up to theta 6 x to the power of 6 and fit a sixth order polynomial um, to these seven data points. And if you do that, you, you find that you come with a model that fits your data exactly. Because with, I guess, in this, in this example I drew, you know, we have seven data points, and so if you fit a six order polynomial, you can sort of fit a line that passes through these seven points perfectly. Um, and you probably find that the curve you get is, well, look, maybe something like that. Um, and on the one hand, this is a great model in the sense that it fits your training data perfectly. Um, and on the other hand, this is probably not a very good model in the sense that, you know, none of us seriously think that this is a very good predictor of housing prices as a function of the size of the house. Right? So, we we'll actually come back to this later. Um, it turns out, of the models we have here, I feel like maybe the quadratic model fits the data best, um, whereas the linear model, it looks like, you know, there's, looks, like there's some, looks like there's actually a bit of a quadratic component in this data that the linear function is not, is not capturing. Um, so we we'll actually come back to this a little bit later and, and, and talk about the problems associated with fitting models that are either too simple or use too small a set of features all the models that are too complex and maybe um, use too large a set of features. Um, just to give these a name, we call this the problem of underfitting. And very informally, this refers to a setting where there are obvious patterns, in, or where there are patterns in the data that the algorithm is just failing to fit. And this problem here we refer to as overfitting. And again, very informally, this is when the algorithm is fitting the idiosyncrasies of this specific data set. Right? That is, it just so happens that of the seven houses we sampled in you know, Portland or wherever you collect data from, um, that house happens to be a bit more expensive, that house happens to be a little less expensive. And by fitting a sixth order polynomial, we're sort of fitting the idiosyncratic properties of this data set rather than the true underlying <coughs> trends of how housing prices vary as a function of the size of the house. Okay. So these are two very different problems. We'll define them more formally later and talk about how to address each of these problems. Um, but for now, I hope you appreciate that there is this issue of selecting features. Um, so if you want to choose features for learning problems, there are, there are, there are a few ways to do so. Um, and we'll talk about feature selection algorithms later this quarter as well, so automatic algorithms for choosing what features to use in a, in a regression problem like this. Um, what I want to do today is talk about a class of algorithms called non-parametric learning algorithms that will help to alleviate the need somewhat for you to choose features very carefully. Okay. And this will lead us into our discussion of um, locally weighted regression. Um, let me just define the term 
Um, linear regression, as we've defined it so far, is an example of a parametric learning algorithm. And um, parametric learning algorithm is one that's defined as an algorithm that has a fixed number of parameters that's fit to the data. Okay? So in linear regression, we had a fixed set of parameters data right, that was fit to the data. In contrast, what we're going to talk about now is our first non-parametric learning algorithm. Um, the formal definition, which is, which is not very intuitive, so I'll replace this with a second to say more intuitive. Um, the, 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 so the formal definition of a non-parametric learning algorithm is that it's an algorithm where the number of parameters um, grows with m, with the size of the training set. And usually it's defined as that number of parameters grows linearly with the size of the training set. Um, this is the formal definition, a slightly in slightly less formal definition is that the amount of stuff you need, the, the amount of stuff that your learning algorithm needs to keep around will grow linearly with the training set. Um, or another way of saying is that this is an algorithm that will need to keep around an entire training set even after learning. Okay, so don't worry too much about this definition. But what I want to do now is describe um, a specific non-parametric learning algorithm called locally weighted regression. Um, which also goes by a couple of other names. Uh, well, which also goes by the name Loess for sort of historical reasons. Loess is usually spelled L-O-E-S-S, -S, sometimes spelled like that too. I just call it locally weighted regression. So here's the idea. And um, this would be an algorithm that allows us to worry a little bit less about having to choose features very carefully. So, for my motivating example, let's say that I have a training set that looks like this. Okay, so this is x and that's y. Um, if you run linear regression on this, and you, you know, fit maybe a linear function to this, and you end up with a more or less flat straight line, which is not a very good fit to this data. Um, you can sit around and stare at this and try to decide what other features to use, right? So maybe you want to toss in a quadratic function, but this isn't really quadratic either. So maybe you want to model this as a, you know, x plus x squared plus maybe some function of sine of x or something. You can actually sit around and fiddle with features. Um, and after a while, you can probably come up with a set of features that are modeled as OK. But, but let's talk about an algorithm that you can use without needing to do that. Um, so if now suppose you want to evaluate your hypothesis h at a certain point a certain query point lowercase x. Okay? And let's say you want to know, you want to know what's the predicted value of y at this at this um, position for x, right? So for linear regression, what we were doing was we would fit theta to minimize you know, sum over i yi minus theta transpose xi squared and return theta transpose x. Okay, so that was linear regression. In contrast, in locally weighted linear regression, I'm going to do something slightly different. I'm going to look at this point x, and then I'm going to look at my data set and take into account only the data points that are sort of in a little vicinity of x. Okay. So I'm going to look at you know, where I want to validate my hypothesis. I'm going to look only in the, in the vicinity of, of, of 
the point, this point where I want to evaluate my hypothesis. And then I'm going to take, let's say, just these few points. And I will um, apply linear regression to fit a straight line just to this subset of the data. Okay. I'm using the sub term subset. Well, let's come back to that later. So if I take this data set and I fit straight line to it, maybe I get a you know, straight line like that. And what I'll do is then evaluate this particular value of straight line, and you know, that would be the value I return for my algorithm. Okay, that, this, this would be the predicted value for, um, uh, uh, this would be the value that my hypothesis outputs in locally weighted regression. So let me go ahead and, follow on up. Let me go ahead and form formalize that. In locally weighted regression, we're going to fix theta to minimize um, sum over i to minimize that. where these terms w superscript i are called weights. Um, and there are many possible choices for weights. I'm just going to write one down. So that's e to the minus xi minus x squared over 2. Um, and so let's look at what these weights really are. Right. So notice that um, suppose you have a training example xi so that xi is very close to x. So if this is small. Right, then um, if xi minus x is small, so if xi minus x is close to zero, then this is e to the minus zero, and e to the zero is, is one. So if xi is close to x, then wi will be close to one. In other words, the weights associated with the i training example will be close to one if xi and x are close to each other. Conversely, if xi minus x is large, oops, um, then I don't know, what would wi be? Zero, right? Close to zero. Cool, right? So if this is if xi is very far from x, then this is e to the minus of some large number, and e to the minus of some large number would be close to zero. Okay. Um, so the picture is if I'm querying at a certain point x um, shown here on the x-axis, and if my data set yeah, let's say look like that, then I'm going to give the points close to this a large weight and give the points far away a small weight. Um, and so for the points that are far away, wi will be close to zero. And so it's as if for the points that are far away, um, you know, they will not contribute much at all to the summation. Right? So think of this as sum over i of one times this quadratic term for close by points plus zero times this quadratic term for far away points. And so the effect of using this weighting is that locally weighted linear regression fits a set of parameters theta, paying much more attention to fitting the points close by accurately, whereas sort of ignoring the contribution um, from, from far away points. Okay? Yeah. yeah, why isn't it exponentially decaying? Yeah, let's see. So it turns out there are many other weighting functions you can use. Um, it turns out that there are different, re different communities of researchers that tend to choose different choices by default. Um, there is, a, there is a somewhat of a literature on debating what, what exactly what function to use. Um, this sort of exponential decay function is, is, just happens to be a reasonably common one that seems to be a reasonable choice of many problems. But you can actually plug in other functions as well. Um, just to mention, let's start comments to that. For those of you that are familiar with you know, the, 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 the um, normal distribution, or the Gaussian distribution, you know, say this, what this formula that I've written out here, you know, it cosmetically looks a bit like a Gaussian distribution, okay? But this, has actually, this actually has absolutely nothing to do with Gaussian distributions. So um, this is not 
it's not that you know probably if x i is Gaussian or whatever. This is no no such interpretation. This is just a convenient function that happens to be a bell shaped function that don't endow this with any Gaussian semantics. Okay. Um, and so in fact, well, if you remember the familiar bell shaped Gaussian, um, again, it's just the weights you end up associating with these points is that um, if you ima imagine putting the sort of bell-shaped bump centered around the position of where you want to evaluate your hypothesis h, then this is saying this point here, I'll give a weight that's proportional to the height of the Gaussian, excuse me, to the height of the bell-shaped function evaluated at this point. And the weight I'll give to this point will be, to this training example, will be proportional to that height and so on. Okay? And so training examples that are really far away get to very small weight. Um, one last small generalization to this is that normally there's one other parameter to this algorithm, um, which, uh, which I'll denote as tau. Um, and again, this looks suspiciously like the variance of a Gaussian, but this is not a Gaussian. It is a convenient form of function. This parameter tau is called the bandwidth parameter. And um, um, informally, it controls how fast the weights fall off with distance. Okay. So I'm just copying my diagram from the other slide, I guess. So if um, tau is very small, if that's a query x, then you end up choosing a fairly narrow Gaussian, excuse me, a fairly narrow bell shape, so that um, the weights of points that are far away fall off rapidly. Whereas if um, tau is large, actually, if tau is large, then you end up choosing um, a, a weighting function that falls off relatively slowly with distance from your query. Um, Okay, so I hope you can therefore see that if you apply locally weighted linear regression to a data set that looks like this, then to ask what your hypothesis is output is at a point like this, you end up fitting a straight line, making that prediction. Um, to ask what your hypothesis output is you know, at that value, you fit a straight line there and you predict that value. And it turns out that every time you, are, you try to evaluate your hypothesis, every time you ask your learning algorithm to make a prediction for you know, how much a new house costs or whatever, you need to, fit, you need to run a new fitting procedure and then evaluate um, this line that you fit just at the position of um, the value of x, at the position of the query where you're trying to make a prediction. Okay? But if you do this, you know, for every point along the x-axis, then you find that locally weighted regression is able to trace out this sort of very nonlinear curve for a data set like this. Okay. Um, so in the problem set, we're actually going to let you play around more with this algorithm. So I won't say too much more about it here. But um, before I move on to the next topic, let me, let me check what questions you have. Yeah. It seems like you'd still have the same problem with overfitting and underfitting, mm -hmm. like when you have to choose tau. Like if you make it too small, yeah. yep. then you're... Yes, absolutely, yes. So um, locally weighted regression can run into... Uh, locally weighted regression is not a panacea for the problem of overfitting or underfitting. Um, uh, it, 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 you can still run into the same problems with locally weighted regression. Um, what you just said um, about... And, and so some, some of these things I'll leave you to discover for yourself in the homework problem. You, you actually see what you just mentioned. It almost seems like you're not even building a model with this locally related. You need all the data that you originally had anyway. So yeah. I'm just trying to think of it. all seems like you're just the original data points. Right. So the, the question is sort of just uh, uh, what, it's, it's almost as if you're not building a model because you need the entire data set. And uh, the other way of saying that is that this is a non parametric learning algorithm. Um, and, and so this is. And, um, I don't know. I won't. I, I I won't debate whether you know. Are we really building a model or not? But um, this is a perfectly fine. So if I think, what, when you write code implementing locally weighted linear regression on um, 
on the data set, I think of that code as a whole as building your model. Um, so we actually use this. We've actually used this quite successfully to model sort of the dynamics for autonomous helicopter, for instance. Yeah. yeah. Variants of this algorithm that uh, learn the weight based on the data? Um, learn what weights? Oh, the weights WI. Yes, instead of using the, the exponential. I see, yes. So it turns out there are a few things you can do. One thing that's quite common is um, how to choose this bandwidth parameter tau right, as, as uh, using your data. We'll actually talk about that a bit later when we talk about model selection. Is one last question? Why is the sound effect that uh, is not Gaussian? Because if you add the constant, then you can make it Gaussian and then... Oh, the, I guess, um, let's see, boy. The weights are not random variables and it's not, for the purpose of this algorithm, it's not useful to endow it with probabilistic semantics. So you could choose to define things as Gaussian, but it, so it doesn't lead anywhere. Um, in fact, uh, it turns out that um, I happen to choose this uh, bell-shaped function um, for, to define my weights. It's actually fine to choose a function that doesn't even integrate to 1. It integrates to infinity, say, as your weighting function. Um, and so in that sense, you know, I mean, you could, you could force in the definition of a Gaussian, but it's sort of not useful, especially since you use other functions that, that integrate to infinity and don't integrate to 1. Okay, it's the last question. I should move on. I assume that uh, we have a very huge uh, set of data, for example, very huge set of houses, mm -hmm. and we want to predict the level for each house. Uh, so we should run the algorithm for each input, and I think it is very costly. For yeah, yep, you're actually right. So um, because locally weighted regression is um, it was, it was a non parametric algorithm, every time you make a prediction, you need to fit theta to your entire training set again. Um, so you're absolutely right. For, if you have a very large training set, then this is a somewhat expensive algorithm to use because every time you want to make a prediction, you need to fit you know, a straight line to, uh, to, to a huge data set again. Um, turns out there are algorithms that, uh, turns out there are ways to make this much more efficient for large data sets as well. Um, so don't want to talk about that. If, if you're interested, look up the work of uh, Andrew Moore on KD trees. Um, so sort of figured out ways to fit these models much more efficiently. That's not something I want to go into today. Okay, let, let, me, let me move on. Let's take more questions later. Um, so, <coughs> okay. So that was locally weighted regression. Um, remember the outline I had, I guess, at the beginning of this lecture, what I want to do now is um, talk about a probabilistic interpretation of linear regression. Right? And in particular, it will be, be this probabilistic interpretation that lets us move on to um, talk about logistic regression, which would be our first classification algorithm. So, um, Let's put aside locally weighted regression for now. We just talk about ordinary, you know, unweighted linear regression. And let's ask the question of um, why these squares, right? Of, of all the things we could optimize, how do we come up with this criteria for minimizing the square of the error between uh, the predictions of the hypotheses and, and the values y predicted? So why not minimize, you know, the absolute value of the errors or, or the errors to the power of four or something? Um, what I'm going to do now is present one set of assumptions that will serve to, quote, justify why we're minimizing the sum of squares error. Okay. Um, it turns out that there are many assumptions that are sufficient to justify why we do least squares, and this is just one of them. Um, so, so, you know, just, just be clear, I'll present one set of assumptions under which least squares regression makes sense, um, but this is not the only set of assumptions. So even if the assumptions I, I described don't hold, least squares actually still make sense in many circumstances, but this will maybe help you know, give one rationalization, like one reason for doing least squares regression. Um, and in particular, what I'm going to do is um, endow the least squares model with probabilistic semantics. And so, Let's assume, in our example of predicting housing prices, that the, so the price of the house is sold for 
there's going to be some linear function of the features plus um, some term epsilon i. Okay? And epsilon i will be you know, our error term. Um, you can think of the error term as capturing unmodeled effects, like that maybe there are some other features of a house, like maybe you know, how many fireplaces it has, or whether there's a garden or whatever, that there are uh, additional features that we just failed to capture. Or you can think of epsilon as random noise. Okay? So epsilon is our error term that captures both these unmodeled effects, um, just things we forgot to model, or maybe the function isn't quite linear or something, um, as well as um, as well as random noise, like maybe that day the seller was in a really bad mood and so you know, he sold it, he just refused to go for a reasonable price or something. Um, and now, I'll assume that the errors have um, a probabilistic, have, have a probability distribution. I'll assume that the errors epsilon i are distributed, right, just till they uh, denote epsilon i is distributed according to a probability distribution that's a Gaussian distribution with mean zero and variance sigma squared. Okay, so I'm going to use script n here. Um, n stands for normal right, to denote the normal distribution, also known as the Gaussian distribution, with mean zero and covariance sigma squared. Um, actually, just quickly raise your hand if you've seen a Gaussian distribution before. Okay, cool. Most of you. Great. Almost everyone. So, in other words, um, the density for Gaussian, as most of you have seen this before, the density for epsilon i will be 1 over root 2 pi sigma e to the negative epsilon i squared over 2 sigma squared. Right? And uh, the density for epsilon i will be this bell shaped curve with you know the um, with one standard deviation um, being uh, sort of sigma okay um, this is formula for that bell shaped curve so let's see so erase that. erase the board. So this implies that um, the probability distribution of a price of a house, given xi and the parameters theta, that this is going to be Gaussian with that density. Okay? Um, another way of saying this is that the price of a house, you know, given um, the features of the house and the parameters theta, this is going to be a random variable that's distributed Gaussian with mean theta transpose xi and variance sigma squared. Right, because we, we, we imagine that um, the way the housing prices are generated is that you know, the price of a house um, is equal to theta transpose xi and then plus some random Gaussian noise with variance sigma squared. And so the price of a house is going to be, have mean theta transpose xi and variance sigma squared. Right. Does this make sense? Can you raise your hand if this makes sense? Um, yeah, okay, most of you. Um, Um, in point of notation, oh, yes? Assuming we don't know anything about the error, why do you assume here uh, error is a Gaussian? Right, so, um, boy, yeah, so part of the, uh, what is it? Why do I assume the error is Gaussian? Um, two reasons, right? One is it turns out to be mathematically convenient to do so, um, and the other is, um, I don't know, I could also mumble about 
justification such as things of the central limit theorem. It turns out that if you, for the vast majority of problems, if you apply a linear regression model like this and try to measure the distribution of the errors, not all the time, but very often, you find that the errors really are Gaussian. That, that this sort of Gaussian model is a good assumption for the error of um, in, in regression problems like these. Um, some of you may have heard of the central limit theorem, which says that the sum of many independent random variables will tend towards a Gaussian. So if the error is caused by many effects, like you know, the mood of the seller, the mood of the buyer, some other features that we miss, whether the place has a, has a garden or not, and if all of these effects are independent, then by the central limit theorem, you might be inclined to believe that you know, the sum of all of these effects will be approximately Gaussian. But in practice, I guess the two real answers are that one, in practice, this is actually a reasonably accurate assumption, um, and two, is it, it, it turns out to be mathematically convenient to do so. Okay. Um, yeah? It seems like we're saying if we assume the error around our model has zero mean, then the error is centered around our model, which it seems almost like we're trying to assume what we're trying to prove. Um, let's, 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 de let's delay to what I'm trying to prove, but yes, you, we are assuming that the error has zero mean, which is, yeah, right. Um, I think maybe, I suspect later this quarter we'll get to some of the other things, but so for now, just think of this as a mathematical, it's, it's actually not an unreasonable assumption. Um, I guess, you know, in, 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 in machine learning, all the, all the assumptions we make are almost never true in, in, in the absolute sense, right? Because for instance, um, Housing prices are priced to dollars and cents, and so the error will be, you know, errors in prices are not continuous value random variables because um, houses can only be priced at a certain number of dollars and a certain number of cents, and you never have fractions of cents in, in housing prices, whereas a Gaussian random variable would. So in that sense, assumptions we make are never, quote, absolutely true, but for practical purposes, this is an accurate enough assumption that it'll be, it'll be useful to make it. Um, maybe I think in yeah I think in a week or two we'll actually come back to say a bit more about the sorts of assumptions we make and when they help our learning algorithms and when they hurt our learning algorithms. We'll do that. We'll say a bit more about when we talk about generative and discriminative learning algorithms, like in a in a week or two. Okay. Um, okay. So let's just point out one 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 bit of notation, which is that. Um, when I wrote this down, I actually wrote P of yi given xi and then semicolon theta. And I'm going to use this notation when we are not thinking of theta as a random variable. So in statistics, this is sometimes called the frequentist point of view, where we think of there as being some sort of true value of theta that's out there that's generating the data, say. But um, you know, we don't know what theta is, but theta is not a random variable. Right? So it's not, it's not like there's some random value of theta out there. It's that theta is, there's some true value of theta out there. It's just that we don't know what the value of theta is. So if theta is not a random variable, then I'm going to avoid writing P of yi given xi comma theta, because this would mean the probability of yi conditioned on x and theta. And you can only you know, condition on random variables. Um, so at least for this part of the class where we're taking sort of a frequentist viewpoint rather than a Bayesian viewpoint, in this part of the class we're thinking of theta not as a random variable, but just as something we're trying to estimate, I'll use the semicolon notation. And so the way to read this is this is the probability of yi given xi and parameterized by theta. Okay, so you read the semicolon as parameterized by. And the same way here I'll say yi given xi parameterized by theta is distributed Gaussian with that. Um, all right. So, um, let me go ahead and make one more assumption. We're going to assume that the error terms are um, IID, okay, which stands for independently and identically distributed. So this is going to assume that the error terms are independent of each other. Right? 
the identically distributed part just means that I'm assuming they all come from the same Gaussian distribution with the same variance. Um, but, but the more important part of this is I'm assuming that the epsilon i's are independent of each other. Now, let's talk about how to fit a model. The probability of y given x parameterized by theta. Um, I'm actually going to give this another name. I'm going to write this down. I'm going to call this the likelihood of theta as the probability of y given x parameterized by theta. And so this is going to be the product over my training set that, um, which is in turn going to be a product of those Gaussian densities that I wrote down just now. Um, again, in, in point of notation, I guess, I define this term here to be the likelihood of theta. And the likelihood of theta is just you know, the probability of the data y, right, given x and parameterized by theta. Um, the terms likelihood and probability are often confused. And um, so the likelihood of, the of, of theta is the same thing as the probability of the data you saw. And so likelihood and probability are sort of the same thing, except that when I use the term likelihood, I'm trying to emphasize that you know, I'm taking this thing and viewing it as a function of theta. Okay? So, um, so likelihood and pro probability, they're really the same thing, except that when I want to view this thing as a function of theta holding x and y fixed, I'll then call it a likelihood. Okay? Um, so hopefully you hear me say the likelihood of the parameters and the probability of the data. Right, rather than likelihood of the data or probably of parameters. So, so, I try to use, so I try to be consistent in that terminology. Um, so given that the probability of the data is this, and this is also the likelihood of the parameters, um, how do you estimate the parameters theta? So given a training set, what parameters theta do you want to choose for your model? Well. Um, the uh, principle of maximum likelihood estimation says that right, um, you can choose the value of theta that makes the data as, like, as probable as possible. Right, so choose theta to maximize the likelihood. Or in other words, choose the parameters that make the data as, as probable as possible. Right? So this is maximum likelihood estimation from statistics. So it's choose the parameters that you know, makes it as likely, as probable as possible for me to have seen the data I just did. Um, and so, for mathematical convenience, let me define lowercase l of theta. Um, this is called the log likelihood function, and it's just log of, you know, l of, of capital L of theta. So this is log of product over i, 2 pi sigma, e to the that. And I won't, I won't bother to write out what's in the exponent for now. It's just the same as from the previous board. Um, log of the product is the same as the sum of the logs, right? So this is sum of the logs of um, which simplifies to m times 1 over root 2 pi sigma plus And then log of exponentiation cancel each other, right? So log of e of something is just whatever is inside the exponent. So, um, oh, you know what? Let me write this on the export. Okay. 
so are maximizing maximizing the likelihood and maximizing the log likelihood is the same as minimizing that term over there. Because there's a minus sign. So maximizing this because of the minus sign is the same as minimizing this as a function of theta. And this is, of course, just the same quadratic cost function that we had last time, j of theta. Right? Um, and so what we've just shown is that the ordinary least squares algorithm that, you know, that we worked out in the previous lecture is just maximum likelihood assuming this probabilistic model, um, assuming, this, uh, assuming IID Gaussian errors on our data. Okay. Um, one thing that we'll actually revisit um, in the next lecture, notice that the value of sigma squared doesn't matter. Right, that somehow, no matter what the value of sigma squared is, and sigma squared has to be a positive number, um, it's the variance of a Gaussian. So, but no matter what sigma squared is, you know, so long as it's a positive number, the value of theta we end up with um, will be the same, right? So because you know, minimizing this, you get the same value of theta no matter what sigma squared is. So it's as if in this model, the value of sigma squared doesn't really matter. Um, and we'll, we'll just, just remember that for the next lecture. We'll come back to this again. Um, the questions about this? Actually, let me, let me clean a, another couple of boards and I'll see what questions you have. Yeah, yeah, I think you're asking about overfitting whether this is a good model. I think less, the, thing that this, the things you're mentioning are um, maybe deeper questions about learning algorithms that, that, we'll come back to this, that we'll come back to later. So don't really want to get into that right now. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, this endows um, linear regression with a probabilistic interpretation. And I'm actually going to use, this, use a, this sort of probabilistic interpretation in order to derive our next learning algorithm, which will be our first classification algorithm. Okay. So um, you recall that I said that your regression problems are where the variable y that you're trying to predict is continuous values. Um, now I'm actually going to talk about our first classification problem, where um, the value y you're trying to predict will be discrete value. You can take on only a small number of discrete values. And in this case, I'll talk about binary classification, where um, y takes on only two values. Right? So you come up with classification problems if you're trying to do, say, medical diagnosis and try to decide, you know, based on some features, um, if a patient has a disease or does not have a disease. Um, or if, in the housing example, maybe you're trying to decide, will this health sell in the next six months or not? And the answer is either yes or no. Right? It'll either be sold in the next six months or it won't be. Um, 
other standard examples, you know, if you want to build a spam filter, is this email spam or not? Is yes or no? Or um, if you, you know, some of my colleagues are interested in um, predicting whether a computer system will crash. So, you know, it's have learning algorithm to predict, will this computing cluster crash within the next 24 hours? And again, it's a yes or no answer. Um, so, there's x, there's y. And so in the classification problem, y takes on two values, 0 and 1, let's say, in binary classification. Um, so what can you do? Well, one thing you could do is take linear regression, as we've described it so far, and apply it to this problem. Right? So you, you know, given this data set, you can fit a straight line to it. Maybe you get that straight line. Right? And, but this, this, and this, this data set I've drawn right, this is an amazingly easy classification problem. It's pretty obvious you know, to all of us that right, the relationship between x and y is, well, you just look at a value around here, and if it's to the right, y is 1, and it's to the left, and y is 0. So, and apply linear regression to this data set, and you get a reasonable fit, and you can then maybe take your linear regression hypothesis, the straight line, and you know, fresh hold it at 0.5. And if you do that, you sort of get the right answer. You predict that you know, if y is, if, if x is to the right of, of sort of a midpoint here, then y is 1, and if x is to the left of that midpoint, then y is 0. Um, so some people actually do this, apply linear regression to classification problems. And sometimes, it'll work okay. But in general, it's actually a pretty bad idea to apply linear regression to um, classification problems like these. And, and here's why. Let's say I change my training set by giving you just one more training example all the way out there. Right? Um, imagine if, given this training set, it's actually still entirely obvious what the relationship between x and y is. Right? It's just, Take this value, if it's greater than y is 1, if it's less than y is 0. And by telling you, you know, that by giving you this additional training example, it really shouldn't change anything. I mean, I, I didn't really convey much new information. There's no surprise that this corresponds to y equals 1. But if you now fit linear regression to this data set, you end up with, I don't know, maybe a line that looks like that. Right? And now the predictions of your hypothesis have changed completely. If you threshold your hypothesis at y equals 0.5. Okay? So. In between, there might be an interval where it's zero again, right? Um, that far out point. Oh, you mean like that? Right. Yeah, 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 fine. Yeah, sure. I'll give you data set like that. So, same thing. Right. So, this, I guess, so, this, 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 this is just, yes, you're right, but this is, this is, this, this is an example, and this example works too. This, this, that would change. Oh, uh, yeah, then I think this actually make it even worse. We actually get in line that pulls down even further. Right? So this is my example. I get to make it whatever I want, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point of this is, is that there's no deep meaning to this. The point of this is just that you know, it could be a really bad idea to apply linear regression to a classification problem. And sometimes it'll work fine, but, but usually I wouldn't do it. Um, so there are a couple of problems with this. One is that, well, so, so what do we want to do for classification? Um, you know, if you know the value of y lies between 0 and 1, then um, to try to fix this problem, let's just start by changing the form of our hypothesis so that my hypothesis always lies in the unit interval between 0 and 1. Okay? Um, so if, if I know y is either 0 or 1, then let's at least not have my hypothesis predict values much larger than 1 or much smaller than 0. And so, I'm going to, instead of choosing a linear function for my hypothesis, I'm going to choose something slightly different. And in particular, I'm going to choose this function. h subscript theta of x is going to be equal to g of theta transpose x, where um, g is going to be this function. Um, and so this becomes 1 over 1 plus e to the negative theta transpose x. Okay. And um, g of z is called the sigmoid function and is often also called the logistic function. It goes by either of these names. 
Um, and what G of Z looks like is the following. So on the horizontal axis, I'm going to plot Z. And so G of Z will look like this. Okay, I didn't draw that very well. Okay. So G of Z tends towards zero as Z becomes very small. And G of Z will asymptote towards one as Z becomes large. And it crosses the vertical axis at 0 0.5. So this is what the sigmoid function, also called the logistic function, looks like. Yeah, question? Why choose a sigmoid and not a step function? Say that again? Why we cannot choose a step function? Is it like that's better than binary? Yeah, let me come back to that later. So it turns out, why, where did I get this function from, right? Where, how did I, I mean, I just wrote down this function. It actually turns out that there are two reasons for using this function that we'll come to. One is, um, when we talk about generalized linear models, we'll see that this falls out naturally as, as part of a broader class of models. Um, and another reason that we'll talk about uh, next week is, well, it turns out there are a couple of, I think, very beautiful reasons for why we choose the logistic function. So we'll, we'll see that in a little bit. But for now, let me just you know, define it and, and just take my word for it for now that this is a reasonable choice. Okay? Um, but notice now that my, the, the, the values output by my hypothesis will always be between 0 and 1. Um, and furthermore, just like we did for linear regression, I'm going to endow the outputs of my hypothesis with a probabilistic interpretation. Right, so I'm going to assume that the probability that y is equal to 1, given x and parameterized by theta, that's equal to h subscript theta of x. Right, so in other words, I'm going to imagine that you know, my hypothesis is outputting all these numbers that lie between 0 and 1. I'm going to think of my hypothesis as trying to estimate the probability that y is equal to 1. Okay. Um, and, because, and because y has to be either 0 or 1, then the probability that y is equal to 0 is going to be that. Um, so more simply, it turns out, actually take these two equations and write them more compactly. <laughs> I'm going to write P of Y given X parameterized by theta. This is going to be H subscript theta of X to the power of Y <laughs> times 1 minus H of X to the power of 1 minus Y. Okay. So I know this looks somewhat bizarre, but this, this actually makes the derivation much, much nicer. So if y is equal to 1, then this equation is you know, h of x to the power of 1 times something to the power of 0. So anything to the power of 0 is just 1. right? So if y equals 1, then this is something to the power of 0, and so this is just 1. And so if y equals 1, this is just saying p of y equals 1 is equal to h subscript theta of x. And in the same way, if y is equal to 0, then you know, this is p of y equals 0 equals this thing to the power of 0. And so this disappears. This is just 1 times this thing to the power of 1. Okay? So this is a compact way of writing both of these equations um, you know, together into one line. Um, so let's talk about parameter fitting. right? And again, we can ask. Um, well, given this model of my data, how do I fit the parameters theta of my model? Um, so the likelihood of the parameters is, as before, it's just the probability of data, right, which is product over i, p of y i, given x i, parameterized by theta, which is, just plugging this in, I dropped this theta subscript just so you can write a little bit less. Oh, excuse me. These should be xi's and yi's. 
So, um, as before, let's say we want to find the maximum likelihood estimate of the parameter status. So we want to find a setting of the parameter theta that maximizes the likelihood um, L of theta. Um, it turns out that very often, you know, just when, when you work out the derivations, it turns out that it's often much easier to maximize the log of the likelihood rather than maximize the likelihood. Um, and so the log likelihood L of theta is just log of capital L. This will therefore be sum of this. And so, to fit the parameter theta of our model, we'll um, find some find the value of theta that maximizes this log likelihood. Yeah. Why are you uh, say that again. Why are you defined? Oh yes, thank you. Thanks. So, how do you maximize this function? Well, it turns out we can actually apply. Um, the same gradient descent algorithm that we learned, that was the first algorithm we, we, we used to minimize the quadratic function. Remember, when, when we talked about least squares, um, the first algorithm we used to minimize the quadratic error function was gradient descent. And so we can actually use exactly the same algorithm to maximize the log likelihood. Um, and you remember that algorithm was just you repeatedly take the value of theta and you replace it with the previous value of theta plus um, a learning rate alpha times the gradient of you know, the cost function, the log likelihood, with respect to theta. Okay. One small change is that because um, previously we were trying to minimize the quadratic, sum of the, the quadratic error term, today we're trying to maximize rather than minimize. So rather than having a minus sign, we have a plus sign. So this is just you know, gradient, gradient descents, but for maximization rather than minimization, and so we actually call this gradient ascent. It's really the same algorithm. Um, so to figure out what this gradient, so in order to derive gradient descent, um, what you need to do is you know, compute the partial derivatives of your objective function with respect to each of your parameters they derive, right? So, um, and it turns out that, If you actually compute this partial derivative, um, so if you take this formula, this L of theta, which is, oh, got that wrong too. If you take this lowercase L of theta, if you take the log likelihood of theta, and if you take this derivative, take this partial derivative with respect to theta i, um, you find that um, this is equal to, hmm, let's see. Okay, and um, I don't know, the derivation isn't terribly complicated, but, but in the interest of, sort of saving you watch me write down the cover of Blackboard's worth math, I'll just write down the final answer. But the way you get this is just take this, plug in the definition for x subscript theta as a function of xi, and, and take derivatives and work for the algebra, and it turns out it'll simplify down to this formula. Okay? Um, and so, what that gives you is that gradient ascent is the following rule. Theta j gets updated as theta j plus alpha times this. Does this look familiar to anyone? 
Did you remember seeing this formula at the last lecture? Right. So when I worked out bash gradient descent for least squares regression, um, I actually wrote down exactly the same. I actually wrote down, you know, I actually wrote down exactly the same thing. Or well, maybe there's a minus sign, and, and this is also flip. I actually had exactly the same learning rule last time for least squares regression, right? So, I don't know. Is this the same learning algorithm then? So, what's different? How come I was making all that noise earlier about least squares regression being a bad idea for classification problems, and then? You know, I did a bunch of math, and I skipped some steps, but, but I'm sort of claiming that you end up with really the same learning algorithm. Say that again? Hypothesis is based on right. Okay. Right, exactly, right. So as you're just saying, this is not the same, right? And the reason is, in logistic regression, this is different from before, right? The definition of this h subscript theta of xi is not the same as the definition I was using in the previous lecture. And in particular, this is no longer theta transverse xi. This is not a linear function anymore. This is, um, this is a logistic function of theta transverse xi. Okay? So even though this looks you know, cosmetically similar, even though this looks similar on the surface to um, the bash gradient descent rule I derived last time for these squares regression, this is actually a totally different learning algorithm. And it turns out that it's actually no coincidence that you ended up with the same learning rule. We'll, we'll, and, and we'll, we'll actually talk, talk a bit more about this later when we talk about generalized linear models. Um, but this is, one of the, this is one of the most elegant results of generalized linear models that we'll see later, that even though we're using a different model, you actually ended up with you know, what looks like the same learning algorithm. And there's actually no coincidence. Um, cool. One last comment as, as part of a, a so sort of learning process. Um, over here, you know, I said I take the derivatives and I end up with, ended up with this line. Um, I didn't want to, um, you know, make you sit through a long algebraic derivation. But later today or later this week, please do go home and look at the lecture notes uh, where you know, I wrote out the entirety of this derivation in full and make sure you can follow every single step of how we take partial derivatives of this log likelihood to get this formula over here. Okay. Um, by the way, for those of you that are interested in you know, seriously mastering machine learning material, um, when you go home and look at the lecture notes, it will actually be very easy for most of you to look for the lecture notes and read through every line and go, yep, that makes sense, that makes sense, that makes sense, that makes sense, and so sort of say, okay, cool, I see how you get this line. Um, you want to make sure you really understand the material. My concrete suggestion to you would be to go home, read through the lecture notes, and check every line and then to cover up the derivation and see if you can derive this yourself. Right? So in general, that's, that's sort of usually good advice for studying technical material like machine learning, which is if you work for a proof, if you think you understood every line, um, the way to make sure you really understood it is to cover it up and see if you can rederive the entire thing yourself. And this is actually a great way for, I, I did this a lot when I was trying to study various pieces of machine learning you know, theory and various proofs. And this is actually a great way to study, which is cover up the cover up the derivations and see if you can do it yourself without looking at the original derivation. Okay. Um, all right. Hmm. I probably won't get to Newton's method today. I just want to say, take one quick digression to talk about. Um, I'm just going to take one quick digression to talk about one more algorithm, um, which was this question sort of alluding to this earlier. Is which is the uh, perceptron algorithm. Right? So um, I'm not going to say a whole lot about the perceptron algorithm, but this is something that we'll come back to later, later this quarter when we talk about learning theory. Um, so. You know, in logistic regression, we said that g of z output, the, my hypothesis output values that were row numbers between 0 and 1. Um, the question is, what if you want to force g of z to output value, to output either 0 or, either, or, output either zero or 1, right? So um, the perceptron algorithm defines g of z to be this. <laughs> 
so the picture is, or the cartoon is, rather than the smooth sigmoid function, you know, g of z now looks like the step function that, that you're asking about earlier. Um, and same as before, we can use h subscript theta of x equals g of theta transpose x. Okay, so it's actually everything is exa exactly the same as before, except that g of z is now the step function. Um, it turns out there's this learning rule called the perceptron learning rule that's actually even the same as stochastic gradient ascent uh, for logistic regression. And the learning rule is given by this. Okay, so it looks, you know, just like the uh, gradient ascent rule, um, or really the stochastic gradient ascent rule for logistic regression. Um, so this is a very different flavor of algorithm than least squares regression and logistic regression. Um, and in particular, because it outputs only values that are either zero or one, it turns out it's very difficult to endow this algorithm with probabilistic semantics. Um, and this is, again, even though, oh, um, excuse me. Right. There. Okay. And even though this learning rule looks, again, looks cosmetically very similar to what we have for logistic regression, this is actually a very different type of learning rule um, than, than the others that were seen in this class. And so, um, because this is, you know, so it's such a simple learning algorithm, right? Just you know, compute theta transpose x and then you threshold and you output zero or one. This is um, a relatively simpler algorithm than logistic regression, I think. And um, when we talk about learning theory later in this class, the simplicity of this algorithm will let us come back and use it as a, as a building block, okay? But um, that's all I want to say about this algorithm for now. Um,